Forty days ago, do you remember? Forty days ago, the church was packed to the gills, both services, breakfast in between, all kinds of eggs, all kinds of desserts, all kinds of good things. And between services, there were the kids out on the front yard gathering all kinds of eggs. So that was 40 days ago. 40 days ago, the altar was covered in gold. There was a trumpet blaring in here, and the organ was leading us into a more profound, a deep alleluia. Your voices swelled together, and the roof shook. We had a whole team of acolytes 40 days ago, all marching in their military precision. That was 40 days ago. 40 days later, this place is, well, let's just say there's room, isn't there? None of you brought any eggs, None of you brought any dessert. Don't worry. I, brought, I, I bought, uh, they, it says on the package that they're bomb pops, but we all know they're actually called rocket pops, the red, white, and blue popsicles, right? It's not quite Easter breakfast, but we're trying, okay? And, uh, you know, there's nothing planned for the children. We're not going to have Easter eggs, but if you saw the rocket, I've got a plan in mind, too. But still, tonight isn't going to compare with Easter Sunday, is it? There's no activity planned for all the children to be part of. The music, the music is still grand, and we're still singing Alleluia, but it's not quite as deep as it was on Easter Sunday morning. And here, lonely sits the solitary acolyte. He's lonely, isn't he? If you ask most people what Jesus did 40 days after Easter, you'll be met with quite a few shrugs. Uh huh. Uh The ascension of Jesus just doesn't garner as much attention, as much interest as his resurrection. Easter feels like, and it is, right, it is, the grand climactic event, not just in our congregational life, but in the history of the whole world. So much so, so much so that you can summarize the gospel this way. I tell you this quite often. The gospel is, Jesus is risen. Jesus, that's the good news. Jesus is risen. And so everything after that, everything after that feels kind of like, well, a cherry on top, right? It's nice. You know, it's nice if you can get it, but that cherry on the top is not really essential to the cake. That's how it feels. Now, I'm not under any delusion that Ascension Day will ever outstrip Easter. Church on a Thursday night is just never going to keep up with a Sunday morning. And for that matter, it's worth noting that only two of the Gospels, Mark and Luke, actually record that Jesus ascended into heaven. Matthew and John certainly hint at it. They certainly speak of it, but they don't record when it actually happened. The resurrection and Easter really should stand out in our life together. But that being said, we shouldn't diminish ascension We shouldn't push it off into the corner. We shouldn't treat it as an optional thing, right? The cherry on top, it is part of the cake. Jesus is risen, should immediately be followed up with, and Jesus is king. Christ's ascension is not just the cherry on top of the cake. It is a step further up. One of us, think of it this way, one of us has gone up. One of us has gone up and gone in. One of us has gone up and in and now sits on the throne of heaven. One of us, our brother, Christ Jesus, has gone in and rules. He ascended into heaven. We say it every week in the creeds, whether we're saying the apostles or the Nicene. He ascended. Why? Why didn't Jesus just carry on in his resurrected body on earth? Why not set up a throne there in Jerusalem, right? Or if he had to go somewhere else, why not set up a throne on Mount Olivet? It seemed to be on the disciples' mind. You heard them ask that question. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? The days of his humiliation were over. Now could begin the days of his exaltation and everyone would see it. Time to get the band back together again, Jesus. It's time for a grand reunion tour. Time to march back into Jerusalem and we'll show Caiaphas. We'll show Pilate who's really the boss. But of course, Jesus doesn't go on reunion tours. That's what old washed up classic rock bands do. And you go to their concerts, I know you do. But it's never quite the same, is it? Jesus doesn't go backwards. Jesus doesn't get lost in nostalgia. He doesn't ever retreat. Our Lord goes up. 
His ascension is not a going back, it is a promotion. Our Lord advances. Here in his ascension, you see our Lord progressing. There is real progress. Now that word kind of has a negative connotation for us, doesn't it? We're conservatives. We're Lutherans. We conserve the past, right? We don't want to be progressives, do we? Those progressives always screw everything up. And that's true. Because what they call progression is not real progression. But here you see real honest to God progression, the progression towards heaven. We'll come back to that at the end. But just think of it this way today. It's a common temptation for us when we read the Gospels or when we hear the stories read out to us to wish that we could go back there. Who wouldn't love to be able to walk with Jesus? Which of you hasn't wished that you could have tasted the bread that he fed 5,000 with? Or, or maybe if it would have been so sweet, wouldn't it, to be able to see the day when he, ro- when he raised his friend Lazarus? Or if you could have stood on the seashore and seen him out there in Peter's boat and heard his voice preaching? Which of us hasn't thought that it's all kind of a letdown, Right? It's all kind of a disappointment now that Christ is hidden from our sight. Now we have to settle, don't we, for the holy Christian church. What a disappointment. Now we have to settle, we suppose, for the Bible. We have to settle for the Bible being read out loud and preached to us. We have to settle, we think, for our children to be washed with water, for a little bite of bread and a sip of wine. Which of us hasn't felt that way? That maybe, maybe this ascension business was a mistake. We think that way. We think that way because we are bombarded, aren't we, with a view that claims that only what can be seen is real. Only what can be touched Only what can be scientifically tested and proven and verified is real. It's called materialism because only the visible material stuff is real. And so all of the causes that really matter are the ones that we can see with our eyes, that we can handle with our hands, that we can study, right? Eventually, all of the microscopes and telescopes will unlock all of the mysteries of the universe and everything will be understood. Materialism supposes that one day we will discover all of the algorithms and formulas. One day, all of the variables will be under our control. Someday, someday soon, hopefully we hear, every variable will be under control. That's what passes for progress, isn't it? The ever-expanding managerial control of, well, everything. And the ever-expanding technological control rule that we have all come to hate. (laughs) But that's what the world calls progress, isn't it? Now, as Christians, we ought to be immune from that. We ought to be immune from that materialism. But it creeps in. It creeps in. We all, in our own ways, become practical materialists. Now, we would never deny that there's more to the world than we can see, but in our day-to-day life, it does seem that way. We acknowledge the existence of heaven and heaven's king, but we suppose that he's way up there and we're way down here. And what does way up there have to do with way down here? Heaven and heaven's king are never denied by us, but we suppose that Christ is confined way up there to a place where our disembodied souls will one day go, but where our day-to-day life really has nothing to do with. His going up then, we suppose, is his getting away. And his sitting down, his sitting down must signal the end of his action. You know, like when we go home tonight and we all sit down and kick our feet up, that's what it means. Jesus sat down. He could take it easy. So now we think he's way up there taking it easy and we're way down here working really, really hard. Now, if that were the case, it would be right to think of the ascension as a regrettable thing. But of course, that's not the case, dear friends. What do you see the disciples doing as they stare up into heaven? Are they standing there staring, saying, no, Jesus, please don't go, stay with us? They are overjoyed. They are overjoyed. In fact, in Luke's gospel, it says, as they were looking up into heaven, they were rejoicing. Why? Because one of us, one of our own, and not just any one of us, not just you or me, but Jesus of Nazareth, he who loved you such that he stretched out his arms on the tree, he is the one who has gone up and gone in. 
The Bible's description of heaven as up there above us isn't the sort of thing that you're supposed to try to measure. Heaven's aboveness transcends measurements. You can't measure heaven's distance in miles or meters or light years or expected times of arrival. Heaven is above and beyond, to be sure, but it's above and beyond in the way that it is the place of perfection. It is the creator's created throne room within his creation. And so it's not so much a retreat center as it is the command center. Have that in your mind tonight. The ascension of Jesus into heaven is not the withdrawal of our king into some faraway palace where he has nothing more to do with us. It is Christ assuming the highest station. Here you see who is in control of all the variables, really. And the greatest of all the variables in all of the algorithms and the formulas that we suppose determine our lives is this one. Who sits in heaven? And tonight you see one of us, one of our own, your brother, Christ Jesus, is the one. It's not that now the good stuff is all over, just the opposite. Now the good stuff can really begin. You heard that prefigured in Elijah and Elisha. Elijah goes up in a whirlwind of fire, and Elisha cries out, and it's all a bit ambiguous. Is he saying that Elijah is the, the prophet? Is he saying that Elijah is the chariot and the horseman? Or is he saying that he's carried up in chariots and horsemen? That's kind of beside the point, though. Elijah's ascent here's the point, doesn't leave Israel without a prophet. No, he pours out now a double portion of his spirit on Elisha. And just as his ascent was not a retreat, but in advance, so also Christ. Christ's earthly ministry gives way to something even better, his heavenly ministry. It is no disappointment that we live now, after the resurrection and after the ascension. It is not something that we have to settle for, that we come into the church and receive holy baptism and hear the Bible, the completed Bible, the whole Bible, read and proclaimed and taught and understood. We aren't settling for anything. We are receiving every good thing from our risen and and ascended Lord. Put it this way, what Jesus taught and promised on earth, he is now in position to enforce and make good on. Just imagine, right? Imagine if one of you in this room got summoned downtown to City Hall, and you were installed as the mayor of Paducah. That'd be sweet, wouldn't it? Or even better, you get to go to Frankfurt, and you get some position as the chancellor of, I don't know what, whatever you're good at. Or you get called to Washington, D.C., and you're going to be in charge. That would be sweet. Because now, presumably, you could use that position to improve our lot. You would remember us, wouldn't you? Us lowly brothers and sisters here back at St. Paul's? Yes, you'd remember us, wouldn't you? Well, in a small way, that might help you see what's so great about Christ's ascent. One of us, and not just any one of us, but the one who loved us such that he stretched his arms out on the tree, he is now enthroned as king, and he does not forget you. Those signs that Mark mentioned are certainly stunning signs, aren't they? Casting out the devil, speaking in new tongues, drinking poison, handling snakes, healings. People have made mischief of all of this. But it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? Why don't we see those things now? Well, remember what signs are for. Whenever something new gets underway in God's plans and purposes, he gives confirmation with signs. When it's new, He, in effect, was signing his signature, if you will, on those new creations. Remember when Moses brought the people of Israel into the wilderness? There were the signs, manna from heaven and water from the rock. When Joshua led the people into Canaan, there was the sign, Jericho's walls come tumbling down. When David took the throne, then the angelic armies of God triumphed over the Philistines. And in Christ's own ministry, in Christ's own ministry, all of his miracles were the Father's confirmation of who he was. In all of those ways, God confirmed his acts of new creation. And so too, so too, these signs that Mark mentioned all took place in the time of the apostle's life. And what King Jesus signed then, he doesn't need to re-sign any longer. 
His signature never fades away. The signs that confirmed the gospel in its newness, in its beginning, are recorded for us in the book of Acts. And so you can go and look and you can find healings aplenty. You can find tongues abounding. You can find even a venomous viper bite the apostle Paul and Paul shakes it off like a paper cut. His apostles, his witnesses, his church was then and is now under his almighty power. It's all under his signature. Those miraculous signs were once and they are for all. We don't have to see new signs because he never takes his signature off of us. But now, now is not the time for new signs so much as it is the time for the fulfillment of his promises. Your Jesus, ascended into heaven, has not forgotten you, and he doesn't grow tired of ruling. Seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus reigns to make good on his promises. Because the one who promised has ascended on high, whoever believes and is baptized shall indeed be saved. Because the one who promised is seated in the power of God, not in one location to the exclusion of others, but because he is seated at the power of God, he can now give his bread, his body and his blood under the bread and the wine. Because the one who promised is seated at the right hand, you have an advocate with the Father. You are reconciled to him. That's what we call progress. Not regress, not going back, not something to be lamented, and now we have to settle for how things are. Our world misunderstands what progress is all about. They suppose that being busy and making a lot of movement is the same thing as progress. But think of what that word means. To progress does not just mean that you're moving. It means you are drawing closer to the goal. That's the progress that we're after. Christ's ascension teaches us loud and clear that real progress is not simply about moving around and being busy, but progress means drawing nearer to the goal of heaven. Jesus' heavenly ministry is now to push his kingdom into the corners. You heard it this way. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, to the corners He goes up and sends his spirit to empower the church so that you may be his own and serve him in his kingdom. That means that you are not your own. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You are not your own. You are his precious possession signed by his blood. And that means all of you, by the way, not just a part of you. He wants his kingdom to go into every corner of your life. There is no nook or cranny that does not belong to him every corner of the earth, and indeed every corner of your life. Your thoughts, your words, your action, your family, your career, your leisure, it is all under him. And if that sounds to you like bondage or slavery, just remember, heaven's king is no wicked tyrant. The reign of Jesus brings freedom. He sets free from the power of hell. He sets free from the guilt of sin. He sets free from the fear of death. And so his reign in every corner of your life means freedom and life. One of us, and not just any one of us, but Jesus Christ has gone up. And he has gone in and he has sat down. So yes, alleluia, Christ is risen, but more so, alleluia, Christ is king. And as he went, so will he come again. And then, then we will see everything clearly. Now, now we see in part, but then we will see fully and we will be known fully. To Christ be the glory, now and always. Amen.